later, this weird-looking man vanished. Ah. Uh -huh. And he's never been seen since. So he was weird-looking, was he? Yes, he was. You see, he was wearing a mask, a shiny pink mask, the kind children wear at parties, and a black cap pulled well down, and a long black coat with a collar turned up. He pushed his way into the study, and, and after that, he just disappeared into thin air. Is that all you can tell us? You must have some ideas about the man, some theory. There's only one idea that keeps occurring to me, though I'm trying to put it out of my mind. But I can't help wondering if perhaps the murder was like the invisible man in H.G. Wells' story, and that if you took away the black cap and the black coat and the false face, inside you might find nothing at all. <laughs> We present The Hollow Man, a Dr. Fell mystery by John Dixon Carr, dramatized for radio by Peter Ling, with Donald Sindon as Dr. Fell. Part One, Into Thin Air. Some extracts from notes made by me, Gideon Fell, on the night of Saturday, February the 9th, 1935. Tell me something, Doctor. Do the words the three coffins mean anything to you? I can't say they do. <laughs> Is that where the story begins, with three corpses? Or rather, three coffins empty. That's what I'd like to know. But it's not where the story begins. Then I suggest you follow the example of Alice in Wonderland, my dear chap. Begin at the beginning and go on till you get to the end. Then stop. The trouble is, I'm not sure where or when the story began. It could have been a long time ago. But I know where it began for Boyd Mangan, in a little pub just around the corner from the British Museum a week ago. And who is Boyd Mangan? Do I know him? Not yet, but I hope you will. He's a young Canadian newspaper man working in London on the evening banner as a crime reporter. That's how I ran across him. Well, as I say, young Mangan was having a drink at the Warwick Tavern. Yeah, I've been there. Is it that... Uh... It's in Museum Street. That's the one. Uh, now, Mangan's got to know a few of the regulars, drinking cronies who meet there once or twice a week in the back room. There's old Burnaby, the artist, Professor Grimo, who's highly respected in academic circles, I understand, and his secretary, Stuart Mills. Oh, and a broken-down ex-teacher called Drayman, who's employed as Grimo's librarian. Now, Grimo seems to be the leader of the group. He sits at the head of the table with a glass of hot rum and water holding forth on various arcane subjects like witchcraft and <laughs> black magic. And on this particular evening, he got around to vampires. Do you ever read my article? Gentlemen! <laughs> Gentlemen! I must ask you to put your questions one at a time, if you please. Mm -hmm. uh, now... Uh, Mangan, you yes. were saying? Yes, I'd like to know how these vampire legends began. I believe they're widespread in the Slavonic land. Uh, thank you, Draymond. I was about to say, the belief had a firm grip on Hungary, where it was believed that dead men could leave their coffins and float through the air like a swirl of mist until they took human shape and attacked their prey. Oh. Uh, is something wrong, Mills? Uh, well, just... It seems a bit silly, taking it seriously. It's only superstitious nonsense, after all. Oh, hang on. There must have been a grain of truth in it. Otherwise, the tale would never have got into circulation. Surely there must be some evidence, some kind of proof. Ah, proof. Of a kind, perhaps. Bodies exhumed from churchyards. Strange contorted corpses with blood upon their hands and faces. Yeah, but that doesn't prove anything. Ah, quite so. These were the plague years. Poor devils, half dead, were sometimes buried alive. Imagine how they fought to get out of their graves before they expired. That's how such stories arose. And that's what interests me. And I also am very interested. Huh? I got him here. Who are you? Be careful and for intruding upon your conversation. But with your permission, I should like to ask the famous Professor Grimo one question. Well, sir? 
Perhaps you do not believe a man can rise up from his coffin, that he can move around invisibly, that four walls mean nothing to him, and that he may be as dangerous as any fiend in hell. Uh, no, sir, uh, I do not. Do you? Oh, yes. I have done it myself. More than that, I have a brother who can do much more than I, and he is very dangerous. I have no design upon your life, Professor, but he has. And if he should call upon you... But, but that's enough. Yes. Look here, the, the chap's start raving mad. Shouldn't we just... Uh, no, no, let him alone. Let him have his say about his brother and his coffin. Not one coffin. Three coffins. Very well. Three coffins. As many as you like, for God's sake. And... Perhaps you'll tell us who you are. Allow me, my card. Thank you. Pierre Flay, illusionist. To Cagliostro Street. Oh, care of the Academy Theatre. <laughs> I thought as much. So you are a conjurer. If you say so. Are we about to witness one of your illusions? Not now. When I associate with my brother, I too am in danger, and my time is short. But I have one more question for you. Mm. Very soon, someone will call upon you. Would you rather see me, or shall I send my brother? I'll send your brother, and be damned to the pair of you. <laughs> And as Grimo sprang to his feet and everyone leapt up, the stranger managed to slip away. Although Grimo swore he wasn't upset, Mangan says he was as white as a sheet. But I suppose he's one of these Bloomsbury types, neurotic, always flying off the handle. <coughs> You're wrong there, my dear chap. He isn't. I've met Grimo once or twice. He's a man of iron. So, what happened next? Well, I gather Grimo managed to make some sort of joke out of it, and everybody laughed and relaxed. Everyone except Stuart Mills. Mangan said he looked very shaken. And he must have been fairly shaken himself, because next day he decided to go along to the Academy Theatre to have a word with this conjurer chap. The Academy Theatre? I don't think I know it. No, it's a shabby music hall in the East End. He discovered that Pierre Flay shared a dressing room with an acrobat, a man from Dublin but who calls himself the Great Pagliacci. Well, you see, it looks good on the bills. The real name's O'Rourke. So, what can I do for you, sir? Uh, I was hoping to speak to Mr. Flay. Who? Oh. Uh, Pierre Flay. I thought you shared this room. Oh, him? Mm. I never remember them foreign names. Everybody here calls him Looney. <laughs> well, you just missed him. He is on in the first half, you see. And as soon as he's done, he packs up and leaves. I'll be seeing him tomorrow. I can give him a message. Well, the fact is, I was hoping to find out a little more about Mr. Flay. Uh, what do you know about him? Uh, not a lot, and that's no lie. Nobody knows him. He's not the sociable type. Mm. But I'll say this for him. It's a damn good act. I am surprised some West End management hasn't picked him up. What sort of act does he do? Oh, illusions. High-class conjuring. His speciality is vanishing tricks. But he is a cut above the general run. He works without an assistant and packs all his props in a special box he uses. The size and shape of a coffin. A <laughs> coffin? Yes, he is quite the expert on coffins. One night, I asked him why that was. And he gave me a funny look and says, There were three of us once. Buried alive. Only the one escaped. What? Oh, that wasn't the strangest part of it. I says, sounds like a narrow squeak. You were lucky to escape. And he laughs and says, I didn't. I was one of the two who didn't escape. Hey! Well, I mustn't stand here yapping. That's the adult your dance has finished and I am on next. I was one of the two who didn't escape. That's what he said. Mm. Now, my guess is, Pierre Flay has some kind of grudge against Grimo. He may be out to make trouble. Well, has there been any more trouble? 
since they met at the Warwick Tavern. Well, I can't prove that Flay's behind it, but according to Stuart Mills, Grimo secretary... Yes, 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 go on. Mills says letters have been arriving for the professor every day. Grimo just tore them up. But yesterday he phoned Mangan and said, I want you here on Saturday night. Someone's threatening to call on me. Why didn't he get on to the police? Mangan suggested that, but Grimo wouldn't hear of it. So Mangan said, Flay's obviously crazy. Aren't you taking any steps to defend yourself? And the professor replied, oh, yes, I'm going to buy a painting to hang on the wall, a picture by my friend Burnaby, which is why I came to see you. I mean, if that's his idea of defending himself. Oh, quite so. Have you got Grimo's address? He lives in Russell Square. But I don't see... Neither do I. But I take it your car is outside? Yes. Yes, splendid. And now you go down and warm up the motor while I fetch my hat and cloak. Yes, but look here. When an alleged lunatic threatens a sane man, we may or may not be disturbed. But when a sane man begins to act like a lunatic, something must be done. It was snowing as we drove along the strand, and I noticed a clock in the Aldwych that said five minutes past ten. Uh, tell me, uh, why does your friend Mangan take such a personal interest in the professor's welfare? <laughs> For someone who's only a casual acquaintance. Ah, I believe his personal interest is not so much the professor as the professor's daughter, Rosette. <laughs> yeah, well, that would explain it, yes. You didn't tell me the professor is a married man. His wife died when Rosette was born. She was brought up by his housekeeper, Madame de Mont. Here, here we are, Russell Square. And it stopped snowing. That didn't last long. Uh, long enough to whiten the pavements. Uh, which is Grimo's house? That one. The blinds are down, but you can see lights in the ground floor window. It all looks very still and peaceful under the snow. Hadley spoke too soon. Suddenly our blind was torn aside. The window opened and a figure climbed out onto the sill. He'll fall into the area if he's not careful. He's jumped. Oh, he's cleared the railings. What the dickens? Hey, you! Stay right where you are. Good Lord. Mangan. Oh, am I glad to see you. You've got to get help fast. What in God's name are you up to? Don't waste any time. He's locked us in. Will somebody please tell me what is going on? Oh, Mangan, this is Dr. Gideon Fell. Oh, Dr. Fell. Glad to know you. Yes, yes, yes. But what's happened? Oh, I don't know. There was a shot upstairs. Rosette and I both heard it, but we couldn't open the door. He'd locked us in. Steady on. Who locked the door? Well, he did. Flay, of course. He must be still up there. We've got to find him. We'll have to break the front door down. No, just a minute. Why don't we try it first? <laughs> We're in luck. After you, gentlemen. They raced inside and ran up the stairs. I followed at my own pace. My figure is built for comfort rather than speed. His study is up here. The first floor. Please answer me, Professor. Are you all right? Oh, Mangan. Ah. You must help me. They're both in there, but, but I can't get in. Who's this? Police. A another locked door? Hey, that's right. Rosette's still in the drawing room. She'll be going frantic. I'll be right back. Oh, oh, excuse me, Doc. Don't, don't mention it. Well, what have we here? Uh, you're the secretary, I take it. Uh, yes, sir, Stuart Mills. We've got to get in. Somebody's in there with the professor. I heard a gun go off, and, and he doesn't answer. But I could hear noises. Someone moving about. Oh, keep well back, please, if the fellow's armed. Right. Here goes. <laughs> Once more. Second time lucky. Not so lucky for the professor, I fear. Oh, my God. So much blood. Stay where you are, Mr. Mills. And if you've got a weak stomach, don't look. Come on, Doctor. We could all swear that nothing came out of that room. Though something had tried to get out. Something that tried to drag itself across the carpet. It choked, rolled onto its side, and lay still. Apart from that, the room was empty. Dead? Dying. See the colour? He's got a bullet through the lung. Mills, call an ambulance. Yes, of course. There's not much hope for him, but he may be able to tell us something before... Dr. Grimo. Can you hear me? Who did this? Was it the man Pierre Flay? Uh, no, not him. Then 
Who was it? Do you know? Uh, uh, That's all right. Uh, Madame Dumont's uh, looking after her and... Oh. Uh, is, is he... Shh, I'm trying uh, to hear. Grimo struggled to speak. His lips moved, but his strength was ebbing away and it was hard to distinguish the words. Then his eyelids closed and he said no more. He's passed out. Did Mills call the ambulance? Yeah, it's on its way. There's a small hospital not far from here, practically around the corner. Look, isn't there anything we can do for him? Nothing, except get to work. But what's happened to the other man, Flay? Oh, yes. Pierre Flay, who didn't commit the crime. Grimo himself told us that. Then who did? A good question, and I'll add another. Where's the gun that shot him? And while we're about it, where's the knife? Knife? Yeah. The poor devil has a bullet in his chest. I'm talking about the knife which was used to attack this picture. I assume this is the painting that Grimo bought from Burnaby. Ah, I guess so. What's it supposed to be? It was a huge canvas, lying on the floor as if it had been pulled down off the wall. A landscape, but no ordinary landscape. A crooked tree and a ghostly range of mountains in the distance. In the foreground were three graves, three headstones. But now there were half a dozen knife slashes in the canvas, which gave the impression that the graves had begun to heave and crack open, as if they were about to give up their dead. Which leaves us with a criminal assault. No gun, no knife, and no criminal. He must have done what I did. Climbed out of one of the windows. On the first floor, and closed it carefully after him. He must also have been lighter than air. If you look down, you'll see the snow on the pavement is completely unmarked. Not a single footprint. Ah, here's the ambulance. Fifteen minutes later, when Grimo had been rushed off for an emergency operation, and Hadley and I had searched the room thoroughly, we had to admit defeat. Some of the furniture had been moved around. In front of a huge chimney piece, a leather sofa had been pushed aside, and a chair rolled back, its feet snarled up in the hearth rug. A small coal fire had been alight in the grate, but now it was smothered under a mass of burnt, blackened papers. There was blood on the rug and on the sofa, but there was nowhere that a man could be hiding. So, Mr. Mills, I want you to tell us again exactly what happened. Don't leave anything out, however insignificant it might appear to be. I've tried to remember, but, but everything seemed to happen at once. You say you had this room under observation all the evening? Uh, yes. You see, the little room across the landing is my office. I sat at my desk with the door open, so I had a clear view of this door. Nobody could have come in without my seeing them. And who did you see? Uh, the professor came upstairs after supper at half past seven. He told me he didn't want to be disturbed, but he expected a visitor about half past nine. He didn't tell me who, but I knew who he meant. And I kept my eye on the door just in case. And where were the rest of the household? Uh, Mangan and Miss Grimo were down in the drawing room. Uh, earlier on, Mr. Drayman, uh, the lodger, said he was going out. Uh, well, I didn't see him after that. And Madame Dumont? I saw her when she brought the professor his after-dinner coffee. And she came up later to collect the cup and saucer. She was just coming out when the front doorbell rang down below. In what time would that have been? Uh, about uh, a quarter to ten. She went down to the front door, and two minutes later she came upstairs with a visiting card on a silver tray. She was about to knock at the professor's door, when, to my surprise, I saw the stranger following her. When she turned round and found him close behind her, she was very startled. <gasps> what are you doing here? Huh? I ask you to wait in the hall. My time is short. I cannot wait. You must wait. Stay there until I have spoken to Professor Grimo. I tell you, I cannot wait. You will permit me to open the door. How dare you! What is the meaning of this? In God's name, who are you? Don't push me! Just come back at once! That was the last I saw of him, whoever he was. He forced his way into the room. The door shut. I know it sounds impossible, but I swear he... Take a deep breath, Mr. Mills. There's no need to be alarmed. All right, Doctor, leave it to me. Mr. Mills, are you telling me this mysterious stranger just disappeared off the face of the earth? I'm telling you what happened, Inspector. 
Three of us saw him. The other two actually spoke to him. And a few minutes later, this weird-looking man vanished. Ah! And he's never been seen since. So he was weird-looking, was he? Yes, he was. You see, he was wearing a mask. A shiny pink mask. mask. The kind children wear at parties. And a black cap pulled well down. And a long black coat with a collar turned up. Uh. He pushed his way into the study. And after that, just disappeared into thin air. Well, is that all you can tell us? You must have some ideas about the man, some theory. Well, there's only one idea that keeps occurring to me, though I'm trying to put it out of my mind. But I can't help wondering if perhaps the murderer was like the invisible man in H.G. Wells' story. And huh. If you took away the black cap and the black coat and the false face inside, you might find nothing at all. I don't mm. expect anyone to believe me, but... I believe you. I saw everything. Ah, you are Madame Dumont? I am Ernestine Dumont, and I have come to help you find the man who shot Charles Grimaud. I wanted to go with him in the ambulance, but they would not let me. They said the police would wish to speak with me. Well, here I am. Uh, please, sit down, Madame. I'd like to hear your statement in a moment when we finish with Mr. Mills. Perhaps you can corroborate what he has to say. Very well. So, Mr. Mills... You saw the stranger slip in through that door. Uh, the professor made a move to stop him, but the stranger was too quick for him. And as the door closed, I saw... Well, I, I had the impression that uh, Madame Dumont closed the door after him. What? You idiot! You, you think I would assist that man to come into this room, huh? Alone? With Charles? He pushed the door shut behind him and turned the key in the lock. Well, Mr. Mills, is that correct? I don't know. I, I'm only telling you what I thought I saw. Perhaps I was mistaken. I assure you, you are very much mistaken. But on one point I agree. That devil was wearing a false face. You may continue. Thank you. Madame was very agitated and began to call the professor by his first name and rattle the door. And I heard him call out, uh, 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 Go away, um, I, I can handle this. Well, something like that anyway. And you, madame, did you do as he told you? I have obeyed Charles Grimaud for over 20 years. I never knew a situation which he could not handle. I see. Well, Mr. Mills, madame went downstairs and you stayed in your room watching the door. Until I heard the shot, five or ten minutes later. And during that time you heard nothing else? Well, the door was very thick. At one point I thought I heard voices and, and something else which, which I can only describe as a kind of bumping around. I don't know what it was. Thank you. I'll have some other questions later. In the meantime, would you mind asking Mr. Mangan to come up here? Oh, and, and Miss Grimo, if she feels up to answering questions. Uh, uh, certainly. Uh, thank you, Inspector. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Now, madame, perhaps you'll give us your version of these events. Yes, uh, I will do my best. <laughs> Does your colleague have to wander about the room like that? I, hmm? I find it extremely irritating. Oh, I, I, I do beg your pardon. I, I was studying the books, the decor, the coat of arms above the fireplace. But what are you doing here, huh? You don't look like a policeman uh, to me. Let me introduce you. Uh, Madame Dumont, Dr. Gideon Fell, who sometimes assists me in my inquiries. You, 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 a great pleasure, Madame. Indeed. And... And, and, and how much longer am I to be kept waiting in this icy room? The, the fire's gone out. May I relight it before we all catch our breath of cold? Oh, I see no reason. I wouldn't what... advise that. Not until we find out what those papers are, which someone has burnt in the grate. It must have been quite a bonfire. Oh, why are men so stupid? You do nothing but talk. You know very well who did this terrible thing. It was Pierre Flay. You know that. Why don't you go after him? Because Pierre Flay didn't do it. The professor told us that himself. What? Just before he collapsed. Now, tell me, do you know Pierre Flay? No. I, I never saw him uh, until tonight. But I know what Charles told me. He is a maniac. And he has a brother who is even worse. Charles said one of them would come tonight. And when I came upstairs at, at quarter to ten, the doorbell rang. I went down to answer it, and the man was standing outside. 
He gave me his visiting card and said, please take this to the professor and ask if he will see me. What about the mask he was wearing? Didn't that strike you as odd? There, there, there was a, a street lamp behind him. His face was in shadow. I didn't see it until he followed me upstairs. Much later, I found I still had the card in my hand. But when I looked at it, there was nothing on it. The card was blank. And now, please, please, will you let me go to the hospital to see Charles? Uh, one moment, madame. Uh, I must ask, how long have you been the professor's housekeeper? Let me rephrase that. How long have you known him? For more than 25 years. And for a time I was more than his housekeeper. I tell you this so you will not make any trouble, not for myself, but for Rosette. Rosette Grimaud is my daughter. She was born here. There had to be a record. But she does not know of it. Nobody knows. I trust you to keep silent. Uh, we shall say nothing, madame. Uh, where did you first meet Grimaud? In Paris. You are Parisian? Uh, uh, no, I, I was... Born in the provinces. But, but I was working in the city when we met as a costumier. Uh -huh. And Grimo, where is he from? Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the south of France. His family are all dead. We are all the family he has. Uh, I understand. Yes. Has he ever spoken to you about the Seven Towers? Madame, are you feeling unwell? I'm perfectly well. But I, I don't know what you are talking about. I, I never heard of Seven Towers. Uh, I, I only wondered. Uh, because of this painting, the mountains in the background, they look rather like castle walls, don't they? A castle with seven towers. Uh, do you know why the professor bought this picture? I know nothing about it. Charles would not tell me why he bought it. Why don't you ask Burnaby? He painted it. He ought to know. But... <laughs> The painting means nothing. It looks like the picture of a country that does not exist. Yeah, I fear you may be right. And if three people were buried in a country that does not exist, it might be difficult to find them. Eh, I won't stay and listen to any more of this well, nonsense. Are you all crazy, huh? If someone tried to kill Charles, what would they do? He, he would not put on a mask like children on bonfire night. He would not hand in a blank visiting card, go upstairs, vanish through the window. You sit here talking nonsense while my poor Charles is at death's door. Uh, what's that? What is it? What's happened? I've been to the hospital. You must get there as fast as you can, Aunt Ernestine. They say it won't be long now. As soon as the two women had gone, Hadley made some phone calls. He sent a policeman to Cagliostro Street to pick up Pierre Flay. He called in forensic experts and photographers to go over Grimaud's room, uh, looking for footprints, fingerprints, clues of any kind. And he had all the charred papers in the grate taken away to be examined. Then he remembered something I'd said. I think it's time to compare notes, Doctor. Now, tell me about those seven towers and the country that never existed. Now, let's leave that for a moment. Now, where's your friend Mangan? I think he was talking to Mills just now. Splendid. Huh? Let's have him in. I think he may be able to help us. Well, if you say so. Ah, Mangan, uh, a word with you, please. Oh, how he's going to help us. Mangan was in here when the professor passed out. I want to ask him if... Yes, what is it? Uh, come in. And shut the door. Uh, sure. What can I do for you? Uh, this may be nothing, or it may be the most important clue of all. I'm talking about those faint mutterings we heard from Grimaud mm. just before he lost consciousness. The inspector asked if Flay had shot him, and he said no. Right. So I asked him who did it. Exactly. And what did he say? I want you both to tell me exactly what you thought you heard. Well, the first word sounded to me like Harvard, and then something about a bath. Uh, then he said something that sounded like not suicide, not and suicide. something about got gun. Uh, you heard some of it, but not in the right order. Oh? After the word bath, I heard him say salt and wine. Salt. I heard got gun, and last of all, don't blame poor... Don't blame poor who? I don't know. 
That's when he passed out. Uh, hover, bath, salt, wine, not suicide, got gun. Don't blame poor. Uh, let's try to work out what happened in here after the shot was fired. Mm-hmm. There are signs of a struggle, bloodstains on the sofa and the rug. The fireplace seems to be the center of activity. Maybe the stranger escaped through the chimney. No, I looked up. It starts off wide enough, then the flue becomes so narrow you could barely get your fist through. But think about those charred papers and the behavior of Madame Dumont. From the moment she walked in, she kept looking at that grate. When I went to investigate, she became almost hysterical. She even asked us to light the fire. She wanted to make sure that those papers were completely destroyed. So she knew what was going on. After he was shot, Grimo went to desperate lengths to destroy evidence of some sort. She knew that. It was a secret they shared. Yeah, what kind of secret? I can only tell you part of it. For a start, neither Grimo nor Dumont is French. What? what? They are Hungarian. I recognize the coat of arms on the chimney breast. And I found several books in Hungarian on the shelves. Some with Grimo's real name on the flyleaf. Karoli, the Hungarian version of Charles. Karoli Grimo Horvath. Well. <laughs> he, he tried to tell us his name. Hoverbath. <laughs> I think he came from Transylvania. A part of Hungary later annexed by Russia. So it's a kingdom that no longer exists. Ten out of ten. And I'll tell you something else. Sometime around the turn of the century, Karli Horvath and his brothers were sent to prison. Well, he has brothers? Oh, yes. Two brothers. One calling himself Pierre Flay, and another whom we haven't seen. They were sent to the salt mines at Zeventyorma, the Seven Towers. Uh... Not salt wine, but salt mines. But that's not the secret he's been trying to cover up. I believe he committed some crime involving coffins and people being buried alive. Three of them buried alive, only one escaped. I've already got a man out looking for Flay. But what about the third brother, the Invisible Man? Where is he now? Like his brothers, he may have taken a French name. We already have Charles and Pierre. For argument's sake, let's call him Brother Henri. And what can you tell us about Brother Henri? Nothing. Nothing at all. Come in. I believe you wanted to see me, Inspector. Ah, Miss Grimo, yes. If you're sure you feel well enough to answer questions. Quite well, thank you. But I have a question to ask you, gentlemen. Is it true this story I hear about a man attacking my father and disappearing into thin air? Not quite. I've no doubt it was a perfectly simple trick. And we shall soon find out how it was done. I hope you may be able to help us. If I can, I will. What do you want to know? I understand you and Mr. Mangan were downstairs when the visitor arrived. Did you see or hear him at all? We didn't see him, but we heard the bell, and presently Aunt Ernestine said something like, Wait here. Then he called to us. It's only me going up to see the governor. Mr. Draymond's the only person who calls Father Governor. But he sounded rather hoarse, as if he had a cold. But Draymond lives here. Why would he ring the bell? He could have gone out without his key. Mangan, why in heaven's name didn't you say Well, afterwards we realized it couldn't have been Draymond, so we kept quiet about it. Well, we didn't want to put the old boy through the third degree. He wouldn't hurt a fly. He's the kindest man alive. He throws parties for the local children on bonfire night. However, Hatley decided it was high time we made some inquiries about the elusive Mr. Draymond. He asked Rosette and Mangan to wait downstairs then called in Stuart Mills. Mr. Mills, you told us Mr. Drayman had gone out. Uh, yes, he said he was going to a concert at the Albert Hall. It must have been a long concert. It's getting off at midnight. Never mind that. What can you tell us about him? How long have you known him? Well, ever since I came to work here. He's lived in the basement for years. He's employed as a librarian, though he has very poor eyesight. Uh, reading for any length of time gives him a bad headache. So it was really a sinecure? Do you suppose Drayman has some sort of claim on Professor Grimo? Once, in an expansive mood, the professor told me Drayman had saved his life. Ah. And I understand he entertains the local children on bonfire night. He had two children of his own who were killed in a tragic accident ages ago. And his wife died soon after of a broken heart. 
he likes to do something for the neighbouring children. He saves up all the year round. Excuse and me, he... sir. Uh, could you spare a minute? Oh, very well. Uh, uh, Mr Mills, perhaps you can go and see if Draymond has returned. Uh, I'd like a word with him. Uh, yes, Inspector, of course. Thank you. Well, Sergeant, what is it? A couple of things, sir. Report from Cayostro Street. The constable was unable to raise anyone at number two. Mr. Flay appears to be out. Really? And what's that you've got there? A package and a letter from the surgeon at the hospital, sir. Oh, thank you. For Inspector Hadley. Charles Grimo died at 11.30pm. I'm sending you the bullet I extracted at point three eight. He was barely conscious by the end and said certain things which can be attested by the nurses who were present. His exact words were, It was my brother who did it. I never thought he would shoot. God knows how he got out of that room. One second he was there and the next he wasn't. I want to tell you who my brother is. He died before he could say any more. If there is anything further I can do, please let me know, etc., etc. When Mills returned, he said Draymond had been downstairs all the time, fast asleep. So we went to his room at once. Uh, Mr. Draymond? I'm Inspector Hadley, and uh, this is Dr. Gideon Fell. Oh, I, I, how do you... Do? Oh, I beg your pardon. Oh, I'm afraid I, I'm not quite awake. We were told oh. you'd gone to a concert. I meant to, but then I had a very bad headache, so uh, I took a sleeping pill and, uh, and lay down. Oh. The next thing I knew was Mills waking me up and, and telling me uh, about the professor. Uh, is he... Uh... Professor Grimo is dead. God rest his soul. Charles Grimo was a very good friend to me. I wish there was something I could do. There is. Tell us, where and when did you first meet? Oh, it must have been about 1905, in Paris. Uh, I was at the university... Earlier than that, there. I think. Uh, you uh, helped him escape from the Siventura prison in Carpathia, didn't you? How did you know? Tell us the truth about Carly Orvath. And his brothers, we believe one of them killed him. Oh, no, no, that's impossible. He and his brothers were imprisoned for some political offence, but the other two died there of bubonic plague. You must tell us everything you know. Uh, one day, in 1901, uh, I was travelling through Carpathia on horseback. Uh, the wind was howling, and then I came upon three graves... Newly dug. Very like the scene in Burnaby's painting. Mountains and three headstones. I never told Burnaby any of this. There were no headstones on those graves, just three crosses made of sticks and the wind blowing. Suddenly, my horse saw the graves and reared up in terror. And I saw it too. One of those mounds of earth was heaving, slithering. Suddenly I heard something breaking open. A dark, mud-coloured thing fumbling into the light. The groping fingers of a hand. A man trying to struggle free. So I went to help him. Dear God. He told me not to be alarmed. He swore he was not dying of the plague. He was a political prisoner making his escape. His brothers had died in their cell and... Charles then persuaded the prison doctor to pretend he'd died with them. They were all buried in shallow graves. But the doctor smuggled a pair of wire cutters into his coffin. As long as he kept his nerve and didn't use up too much air, he could force open the lid and push his way up through the loose earth. But even so, how could he possibly... He had some money hidden away in his village. There were no passports in those days. We travelled to Paris... Uh, well, uh, there was a, a girl I think who we know who she was. Uh, yes, we don't want to rake up old scandals. Uh, the professor made me swear never to tell this story. But now, uh, I suppose it doesn't matter. When I got to bed that night, I lay awake thinking, if Grimo's brothers had died in prison, his last words made no sense at all. At breakfast time, Hadley arrived with the morning paper and threw it down in front of me. Have you seen this? So much for Pierre Play. Magician murdered by magic. Little of Cagliostro Street. 
The second bullet is for you. What is all this? I let the papers make a splash so we could appeal for your information. I'll read it while you eat your toast. Though I warn you, it may spoil your appetite. Pierre Flay, a French conjurer, was found shot at ten o'clock last night in mysterious circumstances. <laughs> ten o'clock? That was... Yes, about five minutes after Grimo was shot while we were all at Russell Square. What else does it say? Cagliostro Street is a cul-de-sac with a few shops on the corner and a terrace of houses along each side. Two visitors to London were returning to their boarding house when they heard someone following them and glanced back to see a third man, later identified as Flay, a short distance behind them. At the same time, Police Constable Wilson, on patrol, crossed the entrance to Cagliostro Street and looked in. They all heard a cry of alarm. Then someone uttered the words, The second bullet is for you followed by a mocking laugh and a pistol shot. As they turned round, Flay stopped, screamed, and pitched forward onto his face. There was no one else in the street. This was confirmed by Constable Wilson, who found the victim with a bullet wound under his shoulder blade. The weapon, a .38 Colt revolver, had been thrown down some ten feet off. The singed condition of Flay's overcoat showed the weapon could only have been fired from a few inches away, but the wound in the back was in such a position... Suicide was impossible. Well, what do you think? I don't think I shall finish my breakfast. Charles is dead. Pierre is dead. Yes. I think we need to find Brother Henri. In part one of The Hollow Man by John Dixon Carr... Dr. Gideon Fell was played by Donald Sindon, and Detective Inspector Hadley by John Hartley. Professor Grimo, Nigel Davenport, Boyd Mangan, Chris Pavlo, Stuart Mills, Johan Meredith, Ernestine Dumont, Jilly Mears, Rosette Grimo, Amanda Gordon, Henry Drayman, Hugh Dixon, Michael O'Rourke, Steve Hodson, Pierre Flay, Sean Baker, Sergeant Betts, Robert Harper. The Hollow Man was dramatized for radio by Peter Ling and directed by Enid Williams. <laughs>